Okay, this is another live stream. Thank you. As the Brooklyn Table and the Choir play in the background. Let me take that down. So this morning, friends, I want to share something with you. And this that we're going to share this morning is not an easy topic for anyone to deliver. This message is the mark of the beast. This is a heavy message. And as we look at this message this morning, friends, I just pray that God will take us through it and help us to understand it. So, as we go through, let's seek the Lord in prayer. As we look at the topic, the mark of the beast. So, eternal God and our Father, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness, your grace, and your mercy to us. We pray, Lord, and ask that you will help us as we look at this topic. To, Lord, see what you want us to see from this message as we go from day to day. I pray eternal God that you will teach us your way, Lord, and show us what to do. Help us, Heavenly Father, to be open-minded to what's happening around us and lord to understand that you are here for our deliverance you are here for our protection you are here lord god to guide us and to keep us so whatever we do lord help us to know and to understand that you are with us to help us through in Jesus' mighty name, amen. So, as we look at this topic, the mark of the beast, it's a topic that scares to even study the Bible. But friends, you and I don't need to be scared because God will help us to understand what we need to understand from his word. So, the mark of the beast is a topic that is really 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 hard to grapple around by many people and as we look at it this morning we want to look at it that this message has for us okay so Okay, the mark of the beast. So, according to Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45, 
there's a major conflict involving the people of God at the time of the end. While the people of Daniel, while the, while the book of Daniel does not give extent, I mean, not only the general implications of the final conflict as found in the book of Daniel, but also the conflict, the specific issue of the conflict as described clearly in the book of Revelation. So conflict in the book of Daniel, the stories in the book of Daniel illustrate the crisis that the prophecies foretell God's people will go through in the end time. Two of these are the stories of the fire furnace in Daniel 3 and the lion's den in Daniel 6. The command the people to worship in Daniel 3 verse 4. We see here from Daniel 3 verse 4 that Nebuchadnezzar command the people to worship the golden image. Nebuchadnezzar told them to fall down and worship the golden image which he has set up. So, an image was erected on the plain of Dura. Those who refused to bow down and worship the image were to be thrown into a fiery furnace. Here was an attempt by Nebuchadnezzar to force people to worship his false god and break the commandment of God that forbids bowing down to images. The issue was clearly false worship and disobedience to the commandments of God. God. So he, there we see the issue of false worship and force. What was Daniel pro, what was Daniel prohibited from doing in the crisis of Daniel 6, Daniel 6 and 7? Whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for 40 days except from thee, O king, that individual shall be cut into pieces and thrown into the lion's den. In other words, if any individual asks any petition of any man, that individual will re be recognized and singled out as one who is going against the dictate, risking their own existence. So we see from this here that all these things, beloved, happened in the past and these will be repeated in our future. So while, Daniel, in that, while in Daniel 3, there was an introduction to false worship in Daniel 6, there is a command that prohibits worship. Daniel is not allowed even to pray to his God. In the crisis that will come to God's people in the time of the end, both issues will be present. Induce them to false worship. So the authority will attempt at first to induce God's people to false worship. So that's what will happen first in the crisis to come. When that, far, when that fails, beloved, the authorities will eventually prohibit that these days are not far hence based on what's happening in our society today. The conflict in the book of Daniel will be repeated in the end time. The book of Revelation contains the startling details of that crisis. The beast in Revelation chapter 13, this, so we say then, the, we look at the beast in Revelation chapter 13, verse 1 and 2. The Bible tells us, the Bible tells us that it was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Note, beloved, that Revelation 13, 1 to 10 primarily describes the papal system. 
as it operates during the Dark Ages. The beasts mentioned here are the same as Daniel's beast in chapter 7. What happened to the papacy at the end of the Dark Ages? Revelation 13 verse 3 tells us. Verse Revelation 3, 13, 3 and 10 tells us. One of his head was wounded unto death. He that leadeth into captivity shall also go into captivity. Note here, beloved, that in 1798, Bertia, the French general under Napoleon, took the Pope prisoner, thus inflicting the deadly wound. So, what was to happen to the papacy after they received after he received a deadly wound? Revelation 13, verse 3 tells us. His deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. Beloved, after receiving the deadly wound in 1798, the papacy was to be revived. Eventually, the whole world would wander after the papacy. Eventually, we see that took place and is still happening today. Revelation 13, 11 to 18 adds some very significant details. However, it points out that this revived papacy will not stand alone. As we can see, it predicts that another power would join with it to force people to worshiping the beast, the first beast, the papacy. Friends, as we look in our world today, we can see things are boiling down to one great climatic ending. And that is, man will force God's people to worship according to their way and not according to the leading of the Spirit of God upon the minds and consciences of men. So, as we look at this second beast in Revelation 13, 11, it says, the beast here from Revelation chapter 13, 11, he's coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb. He spake as a dragon. Where did the first beast come from? Revelation 13, verse 1. The first beast comes out of the sea. What do the seas represent? Revelation 17 verse 15 tells us that the sea represents people and multitudes and nations and tongues. Note, beloved, that the first beast rose out of the sea. The second beast rose out of the earth. If the seas represents multitude of people, the earth must represent an underpopulated area of the planet. So, when we look at the beast, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 13, from verse 11 and down, he comes up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb. He spake as a dragon. Let's identify this beast. What is happening to the first beast as John sees the second beast arises? Revelation 13, 10. The first beast is coming into captivity, are going into captivity. John sees the second beast arises at the same time the first beast is going into captivity. And this is sometimes round about 1798. How does John describe the second beast? John describes the second beast as he had two horns like a lamb and he speak as a dragon. Note, beloved, that a lamb is a symbol of innocence and youth, freedom in its beginning. This second beast would appear to be an innocent, freedom-loving nation. 
but eventually it will speak as a dragon. The Bible characterized this second beast as a power that arises around 1798. In a new sparsely populated country, instead of arising out of the teemingly multitude of Europe. In its beginnings, it is like a lamb, innocent and freedom loving. But eventually, it will speak as a dragon. How does the dragon speak? Oppose God. The voice of the dragon, persecution, failure to acknowledge wrong, failure to acknowledge wrong, persecution, and opposition to God. The dragon's voice. Only one power, beloved, only one power on earth meets these specifications, and this is the United States of America, not in its entirety as a country, but the apostate Protestantism in the United States of America. Certainly, we can be thankful for this great nation of America and the great freedom it allows. But the Bible predicts, beloved, that time will come when this nation will no longer be the freedom-loving nation that it is now is. And that has characterized its first 200 years of existence. It will speak as a dragon. It will oppose God. How does the dragon speak? Revelation 12, 13. He persecutes the woman which brought forth the man-child. He persecutes the church of the living God. Whose power does the United States exercise this? And what does it cause its people to do? The Bible tells us that he exercised all the power of the first beast before him. He caused the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Note, beloved, that the issue in this conflict is the same issue that we have seen throughout the book of Daniel, the issue of true worship versus false worship. The first beast persecuted those who disagree with it. The second beast will likewise persecute dissenters in its attempt to force people to worship this first beast, the papacy whose deadly wound is now being healed. Friends, What does the second beast do in order to convict or convince the world to worship the first beast? What does the second beast do? This is what the second beast do in verse 13 and 14. He doeth great wonder and deceive them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of man and in the sight of miracle, the United States, a prostate Protestantism in the United States, the fallen church in the United States, as its people will join hands with the revived papal apostasy and convince the world that they have God's truth so remember, beloved, this is not the entire nation of America. This prophecy is, is not saying that this is the entire nation of America because in America you have loads of individuals. It has nothing to do with the United States government. This, beloved, is the apostate Protestantism in America, the fallen church who is vying for their way, their rights.
who are petitioning Congress to, 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 to pass certain laws to make their day of worship absolute and the only day for worship, and they are strong in their petitioning, they will join hands with the Roman power to enforce the teachings of the church in churches the apostate protestantism and romanism will join hands in persecuting god's people through false signs wonders and miracles these churches will join hands with the revived papal apostasy convince the world that they have god's truth because of all the miracles being performed what does the second beast create as a result of all these miracles? Verse 14 tells us that, that they should make an image to the beast. Note, an image is, like, is a likeness of the original. The beast's power was a union of church and state persecuting those who disagreed, an image to the beast, this first beast we are talking about, the image, beloved, is the image to the first beast, the Roman power. An image is a likeness. So the beast's power was a genius. An image to the beast would therefore be an American corporation of church and state. That will persecute those who disagrees with its teachings. What does the image of the beast proclaim? Will be done to those who do not worship it. Revelation 13 verse 15. That as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Beloved, as we continue on, can see that this is not far hence. This union is not far hence. So, what does this revived Papal American Union now impose on people? The apostate Protestantism and the revived Roman power. In the future, what do they propose or impose on people? They what happened to those who refuse? To receive this mark, that no man might buy or sell, except he that had the mark of the beast. This second beast, which we now see, this second beast, which we now see to be a coalition of the apostate Protestantism in America. American religious leaders with a revived papal apostasy will seek to persecute those who disregard with it, disagree with it. It will impose the mark of the beast with all its economically and ultimately beloved will attempt to exercise the death, to execute rather the death penalty upon those who do not worship this power. To worship the beast does not mean a person needs to join the beast power. One only had to bow in humble obedience to the authorities of the beast power and thereby worship the beast. The mark of the beast. What does the papacy think it has? What does the papacy, beloved, beloved, to the fact that this power, the revived papal power in the dark ages, this power thinks itself to have 
the right and the power to change times and laws. History bears out that the Roman church indeed did change the time and the laws by attempting to change God's sacred seventh day Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. She did this. She did not she was not afraid to boldly declare that she has changed it. She did this not by authority of Christ or by the Bible, but by her own authority. Does the Roman church agree with history about the change of the Sabbath? Yes, they do. As we look from Exhibit 1, we see here, beloved, from these testimonies, church admission of changing the Sabbath. Question, what is the third commandment? Answer, the third commandment is, remember though, keep holy the Sabbath day. Which is the Sabbath day? Answer, Saturday is the Sabbath day. So that we see here, what is, what is the third commandment? The fourth commandment is the Sabbath day. So why do we observe sat Sunday instead of Saturday? We observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. The Converts Catechism of Catholic Doctrine, 1951, printed page 50. So, question, how prove you that the church had power to command feast and holy days? Answer. By the very act of changing the Sabbath, whereby they fondly contradict themselves by keeping Sunday strictly and break Henry Tuberville, an abridgment of the Christian doctrine, 1833, page 58. You will tell men that Saturday was the Jewish Sabbath, but that the Christian Sabbath has been changed to Sunday. Change, but by whom? Who has authority to change an express commandment of Almighty God? When God has spoken and said, Thou shalt keep holy the seventh day, who shall dare to say nay? Thou mayest work, and do all manner of worldly business on the seventh day, but thou shalt keep holy the first day instead. This is a most important question, which I know not how you can answer. You are a Protestant, and you profess to go by the Bible, and the Bible only, and yet, in so important a matter as the observance of one day in seven as a holy day, you go against the plain letter of the Bible and put another day in the place of the day which the Bible has commanded. The command to keep holy the seventh day is one of the Ten Commandments. You believe that the other nine are still binding. Who gave you authority to tamper with the fourth? If you are consistent with your own principles, if you really follow the Bible and the Bible only, you ought to be able to produce some portion of the New Testament in which this fourth commandment is expressly altered. This is taken from Library of Christian Doctrine. Why don't you keep holy the Sabbath day? Page 5. 
Beloved, Thomas then, Thomas then, Georgia, May 22nd, 1954, Pope Pius XII, Rome, Italy. There, sir, is the occasion true that Protestants accuses you of? They say you change to the so-called Christian Sunday, identical with the first day of the week. If so, when did you change and by what authority day? The reply, the Catholic Extension Magazine 180 Wabish Avenue, Chicago, Illinois, under the blessing of Pope Pius XII. Dear sir, regarding the change from the observance of the Jewish Sabbath to the Christian Sunday, I wish to draw your attention to the facts. That Protestants, one, that Protestants who accept the Bible as the only rule of faith and religion should by all means go back to the observance of the Sabbath. The fact that they do not, but on the contrary, observe Sunday, stultifies them in the eyes of every thinking man. Two, we Catholics do not accept the Bible as the only true rule of faith. Besides the Bible, we have the living church, the authority of the church as a rule to guide us. We say this church, we say this church instituted by, by, by Christ to teach and guide men throughout life has the right to change the ceremonial laws of the Old Testament and hence we accept her change of the Sabbath to Sunday. We frankly say, yes, the church made this change, made this law as she made many other laws. For instance, the Friday abstinence, the unmarried priesthood, the laws concerning mixed marriages, the regulation of Catholic marriages, and a thousand other laws. Thirdly, we also say that of all Protestants, the Seventh-day Adventists are the only group that reason correctly and are consistent with their teachings. It is always somewhat law Law, lawable, lawable to see the Protestant churches in pulpits and legis, legislatures demand the observance of Sundays of which there is nothing in the Bible with best wishes. Peter R. Trauma, editor. Finally, E. At the last opening on the 18th of January, 1562, all hesitation was set aside. The Archbishop Reggio made a speech in which he openly declares that tradition stood above scripture. The authority of the church could therefore not be bound to the authority of the scriptures because the church had but by its own authority enriched Jews by his own authority. The church, read again, the authority of the church could therefore not be bound to the authority of the scripture because the church had changed Sabbath into Sunday, not by the command of Christ, 
but by its own authority. Henrich Julius Holt Zeman not known on tradition. Berg, Duke and Volge von Fried, Regime, 1859, page 263 in the German. There we have it, beloved. The testimonies from the source itself of what they have done. Since the Roman church so clearly fulfills the definition marks of the beast and the little horn delineated in Revelation 13 and Daniel 7, even admit to the attempting to change the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday, it becomes very clear that the Roman church is the beast of Revelation chapter 13. In the Roman church, beloved, is the beast. If the Roman church is the beast, then the mark of the beast would be the mark or sign of the authority of the Roman church. If we wish to discover what the mark of the beast is, we simply have to ask the Roman Catholic church, what is the mark of your authority and power? Beloved, this is serious. As I said, this is not the most easy of message to present. As we continue, so what does the Roman Catholic Church claim is the mark of her authority? Let us see. Friends, it says, of course, the Catholic Church claims that the change from Saturday to Sunday was her act, and the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical power and authority in religious matters. Reply to a letter dated October 28, 1894, and addressed from Cardinal Gibbons by Chancellor C.F. Thomas. This is what they say. And they are bold. While Protestants is here defending them, they are admitting to the fact, they are admitting to the fact that they are the one who have changed it. It was the Catholic Church which transferred its this rest to the Sunday. Thus, the observance of Sunday by the Protestants is an homage they pay in spite of themselves. So, the Protestants pay homage to the Catholic Church by observing Sunday as the Sabbath. And this observance of Sunday by the Protestants is an homage they pay in spite of themselves to the authority of the Catholic Church. Plain talk about Protestantism of today, page 213, Morning, Mon, Monsignor Louis Segur. Note, beloved, what a bold admission. The Bible indicates that the Roman Church is the beast. The beast says her mark of authority is her ability to change the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. Thus, the mark of the beast is the Roman church's attempt to change the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. This she claims and her power. When Revelation 13 describes a time when no man is able to buy or sell unless he or she has the mark of the beast, it is talking about the United States enforcing Sunday keeping by legislation in order to get people to worship and bow down to the authority of the Roman Catholic Church. Please note, beloved, 
that no one has the mark of the beast today. This is yet future. It is yet to come. But when it comes, God's people must resist it. To keep the, to keep the mark of the beast is to fail to keep God's sacred Sabbath. The sign of our relationship with God to the people of God, a relationship with him is more important than obedience to the beast. Beloved, serious times are ahead of us as God's people. Let's continue. The seal of God. So the mark of the beast will be when America enforce a national Sunday law that no man will can must worship and no other day except Sunday and keep it holy. When this is enforced and passed by law in America, then beloved, Sunday worship will become the mark mark of the beast but now no one has that mark because sunday is not yet enforced by law by any nation on earth when that takes place if anyone find themselves still keeping sunday holy and disregard the sabbath commandment the seventh of the week they will eventually receive the mark of the beast so, beloved, what is the, to be placed on the forehead of God's servant before these final calamities or events takes place? Bear with me, beloved. I know time has gone. Revelation 7 verse 2 says, The seal of God must be placed upon the foreheads of the servants of God. So, where are the servants of God sealed? They are sealed in their forehead. And this seal in here, beloved, is not a literally mark that angels of God are going around and marking the people of God on their forehead. No, it's a settling in the truth of God intellectually and intelligently. A deciding in the mind that you are going to serve God, die serving God in truth and in spirit rather than give heed to the dictate of a system that is forcing against God's will. What does God write in our forehead or in our minds? I will put my law into their mind. If God writes his law in our minds and the seal of God is place in the mind, then it follows logically that the seal of God is found in God's law. Hallelujah. Every seal of any government official or any seal on three essential parts. Number one, the person's name. Number two, the person's title. And number three, the person's dominion. God's seal like his seal of God found in God's law, Exodus 20, verse 8 to 11. It says, For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is. The Lord God, maker of the heaven and the earth. God's name, God's title, and God's dominion are found only in the fourth commandment of all the ten commandments. Amazingly, beloved, God has placed his seal in the Sabbath commandment. Just as the beast has put his mark in the Sunday command. That are sealed in their minds with the seal of God. Indicating that by spending this quality time with God in proper Sabbath keeping, they have developed a deep personal relationship with Jesus. 
Only those who have such a deep personal relationship will be able to resist the imposition of the mark of the beast. Hallelujah. Beloved, this time is creeping upon us as God's people. What warning does God give concerning the mark of the beast? Revelation 14, verse 9 and 10. If any man worship the beast and his image, if you think you're bad, if any man, if you think you know more than any man, if you think you are so bold and powerful, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, this same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out in full strength in the cup of his indignation. My beloved friends, this is the most severe warning in all scripture. The warning against the mark of the beast. Clearly, God does not want anyone to receive this mark. The beast power threatens men with death if they don't receive the mark of the beast. God warns that people who receive the mark of the beast will suffer eternal death. Here, all the issues foretold in the book of Daniel comes together. The whole world is forced to make a decision regarding the whole world is forced to make a decision regarding obedience to God and the worship of God or obedience to the system the beast and the worship of the beast and his system. This is not a question between Saturday and Sunday, beloved. This is a question of loyalty. The day we keep is only an outward symbol. The real issue is who is the supreme person in our life? Christ or Antichrist? Jesus or Satan? The day we honor and keep in this final crisis will reveal who is supreme authority over our lives. The Sabbath is not a minor issue because the real issue over the Sabbath is our relationship with God. To God's people, nothing is more important than their relationship with God. That's why they refuse to worship the beast and receive his mark. That's why they refuse to bow to a dictatorship. That's why they refuse to bow to the dictate of the system and government that in the future will pass these laws to prohibit God's people from worshiping on God's true seven-day Sabbath. Why face? with as we beloved, when we face with a similar command that Nebuchadnezzar made back in the days of Daniel and the nation of Israel in captivity, how did Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego respond? They say, our God is able to deliver us. We will not serve your God, O Nebuchadnezzar. Now worship your golden image, which you have set up. The events of ancient Babylon have close parallel to the events under the imposition of the mark of the beast. God's people in both cases were threatened with death if they did not worship the image. But Shadrach, Mish, and Abad Negro Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego declared boldly that whether God delivered them or not, 
they would not worship the image in these last days, beloved, when the mark of the beast is inflicted, God's people, like the three Hebrews, will make the same decision whether God delivers them or not is unimportant. Hallelujah. They have settled the issues. God is supreme authority in their lives and nothing can sever them from obedience to God and the worship of the true and living God, Elohim, even if they are threatened with death. They will go to the guillotine. They will go to the gallows. They will go to the grave with that purpose decision in their mind that it is death before this honor. God and God alone, Elohim, El Elyon, Yahweh, Jehovah is the only one that gonna have the supreme authority over their lives. They spill their blood joyfully, knowing that they are spilling it for the truth of Jesus Christ. Who are you standing today, beloved? Do you see this as a matter of a day or a matter of loyalty? Do you see this as a matter between truth and error only are between your life and your eternal death? Beloved, I challenge you by the mercies of Almighty God that you will choose today, as Moses said to the nation of Israel in his last message to them, I set before you today truth and error, life and death, and I bid you by the mercies of God, choose life, choose Christ, choose loyalty to Jesus rather than submit to a system that will give you all the pleasure you need now because there's a way that seemeth right to a man, but the end thereof is the ways of death. I bid you, beloved, choose life, choose obedience to God, choose Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Eternal God and our Father, we thank you, Lord, for your words to us. We thank you for the truth of your words. We thank you for your power and the power of your truth. We thank you for the transforming power of your words. May as we walk today, dear God, in obedience to your truth, may we truly be filled with your spirit and your power, knowing that standing with you, we are standing with the conquering king of kings, Jesus Christ, the Lord of lords, our soon coming king and champion. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Thank you, beloved. I love you and God loves you. See you at the top. See you again soon in Jesus' name.